Hi, everyone. Welcome to the December 8th edition of the Timeform U.S. Forecast. I'm David Aragona here with my usual co-host, Craig Mulkowski. And this week, we are looking ahead to the late pick five sequence on Saturday at Oaklawn Park. Oaklawn beginning their winter into spring meet uh, this weekend. Uh, their first day of racing is actually this Friday as we're recording this on Friday morning, but we're going to take a look at this Saturday card focusing on the second half races six through 10, a couple of stakes races in this sequence, those being the ring, the bell stakes for the sprinters, as well as the mistletoe going a mile for the older fillies and mares. But alongside those stakes races, we've got some really difficult to handicap maiden and allowance races a maiden special weight. That's right in the middle of this sequence, the eighth race, and then two divisions of a N1X allowance race with a large $140,000 purse drew large fields as races seven and 10. So Craig, this is not an easy ticket to put together. Oh, I don't know. I did the handicapping. I thought it was really, no, I'm just kidding. I <laughs> thought I'd throw you a curveball there. No, these are tough races as always at Oakland. Uh, it's just big full fields, uh, particularly in the non uh, stakes races. So it, it's a tough one. I'm one that's always happy to have Oakland back. It's probably the, the second closest track outside of the Oklahoma tracks uh, to me. So I'm sure I'll make a few trips this year. It's been a while, but always high quality racing. And as a speed figure guy, I always like that all the races are on third, obviously. And as we go through this sequence, Craig, I don't know about you, but as I was going through almost every race, I found a favorite that I thought was pretty vulnerable, or in some cases, horses that I just didn't like at all. Um, we'll see if some of these morning lines end up holding up. But I thought there were a lot of cases to be made for price horses throughout the sequence. So that can make it difficult to narrow things down enough to put a ticket together. But they could be races that you want to attack just from a, 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 a vertical standpoint in some of these races, good win bets, or uh, if you want to toss some favorites and boxing horses at exact it just feels like that kind of sequence where um there might be bets you want to make along the way even if putting together a pick five pick five sequence seems particularly daunting and uh as we dive into the sequence craig we begin with a race that we already discussed a little bit on uh, our drf stakes previews which you can find on the youtube channel for the daily racing forum we did stakes previews of both of these stakes races at oaklawn park beginning with race six the ring the bell and I think we had some similar feelings in this one, Craig, about the horse that is pegged as the morning line favorite, the number six, Tejano Twist. I have a ton of respect for this horse. Uh, he just always seems to show up. He's been in great form for a long time for the Chris Hartman Bar, and he's run well at Oaklawn in the past. I just wonder if this pace situation is going to allow him to produce one of those uh, top-level performances. I would agree. And he's a horse who he's pegged as eight to five on the morning line. We didn't have the morning line when we did our race preview. And that makes me even more negative on him just because of the pace scenario. I would just say the pace projector has it labeled as a race favor and horses on or near the lead. And those horses are the four top gunner and the nine Sir Wellington. And when you look at their PPs, they don't exactly scream horses who are going to be blitzing their way up on the front end. Not that they maybe won't go to the front. I know there's another horse we're going to discuss, but uh, that could be a pace setter. But yeah, they may may make the front, but it's not like they're going to set blazing fractions, in my opinion. So that's going to make things tough once again for Tejano Twist, a horse who has often encountered uh, slow pace races, uh, particularly of late. And it's been to his de detriment most of the time. And I'll say this is not a favorite that I want to toss completely because, I mean, I have nothing but respect for this horse. He just seems to show up every time. And um, if this pace does come apart a little bit, because as you were alluding to, a few of these pace setters or projected pace setters aren't exactly the most reliable types. So in those situations, sometimes even when they're not going that fast, the speed can come back a little bit and that could play into the favor of a horse like Tejano Twist. We'll see how that all plays out, but it's kind of hard to knock this horse's recent form, even though he hasn't done a ton of winning this year, especially in recent starts. He has run very well against some tough horses going all the way back to when he was a closing third behind Skelly at this racetrack back in the Count Fleet sprint earlier this year, closed into a slow 
pace behind Cody's wish in the Churchill Downs, was arguably against the track two back at Ellis Park in the Kelly's Landing, and then last time got the job done despite not getting the most pace to close into it. That bit on Sunshine got a fair pace situation and was able to run down a field that included that Churchill Downs specialist Bango. So I'm not way against Tejano Twist. I just feel like, as you were alluding to, he could be a bit of an uh, an underlay in here if he does get bet to around that eight to five line. The horse that is the second choice on the line, Craig, uh, one that I know you like, the number seven rivet. Um, I'll be interested to see what price he goes off at in here because I could see him drifting up a little bit from here, but I, I don't think he's going to be that big of a price in this race. And he really doesn't deserve to be because he's the horse that has 120 plus time from US speed figures that on his best day kind of make him the horse to beat. It's just a matter of whether or not you can trust him to produce one of those top efforts because uh, only one out of his last four races really gives him any chance in here. The good news is it was his last race. Yeah, he was in really good form back in the spring and early summer, uh, just ripping off wins, running a couple 120 plus speed figures. And then that kind of disappeared as he went into tougher races. Uh, he reminded me a little bit of Skelly, who I think was also a Steve Asmussen uh, trainee, and that he was kind of beaten up on lesser competition. Uh, and that's where Steve Asmussen kept them. But the, with this horse, he he did jump him up. He tried to Amsterdam. He tried to Gallant Bob with no success. Uh, went to Charlestown. Uh, that race didn't really pan out. And for that reason, he went off 11-1 to 1 at Mahoning Valley in that Steel Valley sprint with the big purse. Uh, kind of changed tactics, not by choice, I think. He didn't have a great start. Came from off what was a pretty quick pace and really blew the field away and got back to that 122 uh, time form U.S. speed figure that we had seen. If he runs that race, I mean, he is clearly the horse to beat to my eye. And I wouldn't even be surprised if he's a horse that's right up there on the lead, maybe even setting the pace, given his past performances and who he's in against. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't think they rated him by choice last time. He kind of got bumped around at the start and found himself further back in the pack. And he was able to adapt to that running style with there being a contested pace up front. But as you said, he was very effective racing on the lead or in close attendance to the lead earlier in the year. So I wouldn't be surprised if they go back to those sort of tactics. And he definitely is a horse that has shown affinity for Oakland Park before. So I think both these horses make sense. Like you, I probably prefer Rivet just a little bit, given his uh, tractable speed in this race. But there were other directions to go, other horses to look at. I know we both had a little bit of interest as a, uh, at, in the number nine, Sir Wellington, as a long shot in this race probably needs to get a little faster than even his best performances to be competitive here, but he's been fairly consistent, outran his odds in a couple of races at Oaklawn Park going six furlongs last season, including a better than it looks second place finish behind Skelly in the Lake Hamilton back in May. Recent form, not as strong as some others in here, but he's now third off a layoff, so might be rounding back into some better races. Yeah, and his speed figures are trending in the right direction, uh, ascending slightly, not like he's making huge strides, but he had run a couple 115s uh, early in this the spring this year. Uh, he's almost getting back to that layoff, and that may very well be good enough to win this race. What I do like is that he's drawn outside. Uh, he is one of those horses shown up near the, the front on the pace projector, so he figures to get a perfect trip. Uh, if he continues to improve, I think he has a shot and he's going to be a good price. Uh, another one I wanted to mention was the, the four top gunner, the horse we do have shown on the lead. I think he is the real question mark in this race. He was a horse who, on his best days, he could certainly be competitive in here. He came back off nearly a year layoff last time in the Phoenix, a race which was very tough, obviously. He went off 49-1 to that day, uh, had a bad start, and just never really got involved. When you watch the race, he was moving fine. Uh, I think they just kind of packed it up on him uh, as, as they neared the stretch without a whole lot. It was obvious he wasn't going to get much, but the real question is the trouble he had at the start. Um, was that real trouble or maybe he's just not quite the same horse because he was a horse when he's running well, who always gets out of the gate. Well, is up near the front. So he's 15 to one on the morning line. I would definitely use him as a backup. Uh, but you know, there is some questions. He's not a horse I love in here. Uh, so that's it. I'll turn it back to you. Cause I know there's a horse you want to discuss. 
Yeah, I mean, as for Top Gunner, I he is a question mark, as you said. He's run well at Oaklawn in the past. So much time has passed since he was in form in the last race. It, even with the poor start, it does leave a lot to be desired. And beyond that, even when Top Gunner was in good form, he was a, a very faint-hearted horse. I mean, just watching a lot of his races, he would almost always be in contention in mid-stretch. And just, he, he has a terrible final 16th of a mile. If he's not a couple lengths in front of the field with a 16th to go, he's going to get caught because he just is a horse that fails to finish off his races time and time again. So that that bothers me a little bit about him, even if he does get back into form here. But he could be a pretty generous price in this race. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, yeah, I was leaning towards the number one Osborne, who uh, I think he is uh, five to one on the morning line, which seems like a fair enough price. Uh, he ran a big race at Oaklawn off a bit of a layoff last season when he was a, a seven length winner against Allowance Company, uh, beating Skelly that day, who just went on a tear after that. Now, Osborne didn't immediately run back to that race, and actually his form went in the wrong direction for a few starts, but it seemed like he got back on track last time when Ron Moquette put the blinkers on, rider switched to Julian Leperoum, but I liked most about the addition of the blinkers what it got him more engaged in the early stages, because when you look through his past performances, he's a horse that achieves his best results when he's in the mix early, and too often it just seemed like he was getting out run in the early stages and unable to produce his best form from there. So I feel like if he's able to get a more forward position, which seems very possible in a race that doesn't feature a ton of speed like he did last time in that Churchill Downs optional claiming race, I think he could be dangerous here. He's got to improve a little bit from a speed figure standpoint, but he still has some upside at the end of his four-year-old season. Yeah, he does. And he's a horse. I don't think I included him in my top four when we did the preview. But as I was handicapping this last night, I would definitely have him on my ticket. Probably as like a B, I would have Rivet as my main A. But uh, he's one that I think is dangerous. Uh, I like what you said about the blinkers. He, I went and watched the race. It did really look like a, a new horse early on. Let's move on to the next leg of this sequence. This is the first division of uh, these uh, two N1X allowance races that are part of this pick five sequence. This one going six furlongs, the same distance as the race that we just talked about. A large field signed on here, Craig. And uh, I felt like between the two allowance races, uh, seven, 10, this one looked a little more straightforward to me. I think that the horse that's pegged as the morning line favorite, the number five Halmstad, is very much the horse to beat in this race. Going out for a lower profile barn, um, a horse that obviously needed his debut on the turf was a big price that day. Actually a big price in his second start when he woke up getting on the dirt for the first time, but was beaten by a good horse that day in Tunisian Sprig. And since then, he's put down a couple of good efforts, breaking his maiden easily at Keeneland. And then last time out, catching some very good horses, including one we just talked about, uh, Rivet in that Steel Valley Sprint at Mahoning Valley. And he was never beating those horses, but I thought he stayed on really gamely in an ambitious spot. To me, he's just very much the horse to beat in this race. I don't know how short a price I'd want to take on him. And if he's a horse that I'm going to, I'm going to single, probably not because there's at least a couple others that I want to use in here, but he's one that will, I definitely think is one of the more legitimate favorites in this sequence. I agree. I have him as an A-horse in here. I think he's very dangerous. Uh, it's kind of funny. He actually went off 6-1 to one in that Steel Valley sprint as compared to Rivet, who was nearly twice the price off that allowance win at Keeneland. Maybe that was a little bit much, but I thought he ran fine. Uh, he had a little trouble at the start, was up close to a fast pace, faded, but this is obviously a, a much weaker spot than that uh, on the pace projector. It looks like he should be able to get good position. And I tend to agree with you. This is a 12 horse field. I, I think there's a lot of horses that you can probably toss pretty safely. So uh, I don't have, it's not a race I'm going to spread too deep. A couple, uh, just two other horses I actually want to consider using. One is pretty obvious, the nine horse Megan's Honor. Uh, it's a horse that ran just fine at Oakland last year, uh, has run some nice speed figures, beat up on pretty inferior competition at Fandle Racing last time, but it was a um, a good speed figure. He ran a 111, which fits here, and it's not like he hasn't shown he can run on better circuits before. He's run big races at Oakland, run them at Hawthorne, so it just seems like Fairmount's his home, oh, Fairmount, <laughs> Fandle Racing is his home base, but he's a horse with some real talent that can ship out 
out and compete. And he makes a lot of sense in here as well. The only other horse that, that I would be willing to give a shot is the three T burns uh, coming in for Chris Hartman, who is always dangerous Threw a clunker in last time. Not sure what happened, but he has back races that could win this. And what makes me give pause to just dismissing him off that bad race is the pace projector where he's shown on a clear lead. And I just know how dangerous Chris Bar Hartman is generally when Oakland Park opens. So I don't want to toss this one out uh, if he's going to be any kind of price like he's listed on the morning line. Yeah, I, I do wonder uh, what we're going to get from that number nine, Megan's Honor, who is shown as the, the close second choice on the morning line. Um, if you just drew a line through his last race, he'd probably be a big price in here because really his form from last year, it doesn't make him that competitive in here. He had run one prior big speed figure at Hawthorne. His performances from Oakland last season, while a couple of them were competitive, they weren't in races that came up particularly fast and they were going longer. Now, maybe the turn back has just really woken him up and he's just much more of a six furlong horse, but both of those improved performances came at FanDuel where trainer Scott Becker tends to have most of his success. Now, he, he has sent some live horses to Oakland, as you can see in this horse's PPs and another we'll talk about later. And I think his ROI at Oakland over the past five years is $1.80. So that's that's definitely solid. I just don't want to put too much stock at a performance where he was beating up on inferior competition last time. He was impressive and he got a very uh, confident ride from the jockey who basically started moving on him almost a furlong out of the gate um, to make that prolonged move to take over and was dominant winner. Um, if he runs back that race, I think he's got a chance, but I view the other short price Halmstad as a much more likely winner than this horse. Um, as for the, the other horse you mentioned, Craig T Burns, I don't know what to do with him. It's It seems a little counterintuitive that a horse would just go backwards after getting claimed by Chris Hartman, but it kind of seems like that's what's happened to this horse. He was in very good form for his prior trainer running speed figures that probably would make him the horse to beat in here, but his last couple of races just ha have not been great. I mean, he ran a decent speed figure two back, but was still beaten as the favorite that day. And then uh, last time out, he was involved in a duel, but the horse that he was dueling with ended up finishing second, almost winning the race, whereas he lost by nearly 13 lengths. And I mean, he traveled well to the quarter pole. You could see Tyler Gaffleyon was riding him like he thought he had a ton of horse underneath him. He set this horse down and just went backwards from there. He's been a vet scratch since that race. I just think there are some red flags with this horse and um, maybe he makes the front here, but uh, it's not like he projects to get some easy lead because there are others that do want to be forward. So I was a little bit skeptical of him. The other horse that I found very interesting that I would probably want to use an equal strength to Halmstad is the number four Underhill's tab. Uh, this is a horse that has been a little bit inconsistent throughout his career, but he did show some promise early on, uh, finishing a second in that sugar bowl at the fairgrounds as a two-year-old. Um, had some ups and downs after that for trainer Al Stahl, but switched barns last time to Robert Medina, who... Uh, has been doing pretty well this year. I mean, if you look up his stats just in the 2023, he's um, winning at a decent rate uh, with some prices. Uh, the ROI is very healthy for this trainer. Um, so doing well with the horses that he's getting as he starts to build his stable. And uh, his last race was coming out of a really tough spot. Um, I mean, you kind of see it in the time form US race rating of 112. And the winner of that race, uh, Easy Action, was very impressive. Got a big figure. Tunisian Spring, who was second. He's the horse that beat Halmstad when that one first tried the dirt. Uh, and uh, Halmstad lost to that foe by about three lengths. Well, so did Underhill's tab last time in that recent uh, N1X allowance race. And he was chasing outside. The pace kind of held together, but I thought it was a solid effort, step in the right direction for the new barn. And I know he's a little light on recent speed figures, but he feels like one that might fit pretty well on the spot. Well, he certainly could when you look at his uh, past performances in time form US. He's had six races in a row that are have blue fractions, uh, some of them multiple blue fractions, and that generally is going to hold the final time of a race back. We tr we try to adjust for that in time form US, but it's not always easy. He's a horse who doesn't have a ton of speed. If you don't trust the speeds in here, which there's every reason not to with T Burns, as we already talked about. And icing is another one who's coming in who definitely has high, uh, high speed, but he's coming in for off a string of wins, a couple of wins at Mountaineer with inferior speed figures. So it does seem like he's going to get some peace in this spot.
Yeah, icing I thought would be the biggest door to decide for T Burns, as you were as you were alluding to. I mean, there are other horses in here that I think are major question marks. I mean, the number ten circle back Jack. I mean, you could make the case that six furlongs on the dirt is really what he wants to do. But uh, it just feels like he's been facing slightly weaker company at Horseshoe Indy when he's done most of his running on the dirt and he's got to get a little faster. A horse that I was kind of trying to make a case for, Craig, and I couldn't quite get there. He's probably a horse that I would use as a B or a C in this race is the number 11 B Sud because uh, he had ability early in his career for Dallas Stewart and just kind of never developed and went on after that and really tailed off in recent starts. But now he's first off the claim for a new bar and John Ortiz. Uh, John Ortiz can do well at Oaklawn. His first off the claim stats really are, are, are pretty negative. Uh, he's just five for 84 over the past five years with a 79 cent ROI. So first off the claim is not a potent move for this barn. But it is a change of scenery for a horse that once had the ability to be competitive in a race like this. So um, if he actually is a big price in here, he's one that I could give some consideration to. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. I, I saw the same negative stats as, as you, so I didn't include him on my picks. Uh, I worry a little bit that maybe this is too short for him as well, but he's going to be a big price. Let's move on to the eighth race, and this is a toughie. It's a, a one-mile maiden event uh, with that short stretch run. This one uh, going, uh, it's for the two-year-olds, I should say, maiden special weight. And uh, another large field sign, Don, oversubscribed, 12 runners in the main body. And on the morning line, Craig, there's a substantial favorite in here, the number four, Orange Diablo, who's listed at seven to five. And uh, I'll just lead off by saying, Boy, I hope this horse is a short price because he is he is not one that I would want to lean on in this race. And just given how many interesting other options I think there are, if I was playing a pick five sequence, I would be tempted to just toss this horse and try to get a little creative in this race because I think there are so many other ways to go. And this horse, to me, just has all the hallmarks of one that's going to get overbet, going out for the Brad Cox barn, um, having won his debut, or I should say cross the wire first. Those horses always tend to get over bet in subsequent starts. Um, I don't know if he was facing the strongest field when he finished uh, across the wire first in that debut event, um, but uh, going back to watch that race, you can see why he was disqualified. He almost pushed the runner up over the rail at the eighth pole, which is very unprofessional and green lugging in under Florent Giroux that day. And then last time out, he did catch a sloppy track, but I didn't love that performance at three to five. I mean, he got a, fa a fast pace to close into, was supposed to eat that field up in the stretch and just never really looked like he was picking up his stride. Actually got passed from behind by the eventual winner, by by Liam, who came up his inside and passed him in the final three sixteenths of a mile. Um, to me, this is a horse that uh, was ready to fire on debut, ran okay, and now they're just trying some new things. They're stretching out for the first time. I looked up some stats for Brad Cox, made in special weight races, stretching out for the first time at Oaklawn. He's 31 for 119, so that's a solid 26% win rate. But the ROI is just $1.30, which I think fits this horse perfectly because I just think he's going to be over bet. I do as well. I, I'm probably not as negative as you because I do think he can win because I, I don't think this race is particularly strong. Uh, he would be more of a backup for me on tickets where I, I like some other price horses. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I'm just not willing to totally chuck him out. One horse I am willing to totally chuck out is the, the horse who's the second choice on the morning line, and that's first-time starter for Steve Asmussen, uh, Imperial Gun. Uh, he's just – it's hard for me to trust a horse going first time out, trying the mile distance, draws what's a really bad post, the 11, uh, the 11 hole, and also named the ride is his son, Keith Asmussen, who, don't get me wrong, he's improved quite a bit since we we saw him in recent years uh, when he was really struggling. He, he looks much better on a horse, but I still just, I don't trust him against uh, other riders of this quality at a short price. I mean, if this horse was 15 to 1, sure, maybe I'd give him a shot. So, uh, But I don't particularly like that horse. I'm not going to use him at all. I don't know if it would really be 3 to 1. It's a tough race. They didn't do us any favors by putting this uh, this race right in the middle of the sequence. 
I'll just mention a, a couple of horses that I do like who are both prices. Well, I'll mention one and turn it back to you in, in case maybe you like uh, the other one as well. Uh, the two Tornado Road really caught my eye. Uh, he's a horse who basically did no running at Saratoga. He had a tough start that day, got caught wide around the turn, didn't look professional at all. But I have to think there's some talent with this horse. He went off seven to one in a race against Locked. Drum roll, please, who we saw run well in the Ransom. That was a really high quality field. Uh, he's a horse who's been working pretty regularly since uh, the beginning, uh, end of October. And it just feels like to me, uh, for a trainer, Wayne Lucas, who almost never wins first time out, his horses often show big improvement. He's a horse I, I'm going to use pretty uh, substantially in this sequence. Yeah, I'll just clarify an orange Diablo for a second. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is I don't like his pedigree for the stretch out. Um, the dam was a sprinter. He's a half to primarily sprinter. So that's a concern, even though Brad Cox has a reputation for doing well with these stretch outs. Uh, the stats that I cited say that uh, not great wagering value there. And that's the point I'm trying to make with orange Diablo. Um, he's seven to five on the line. I could see him going off around that price, maybe shorter the way they bet Brad Cox at Oakland. And I think his actual chances of winning this race are closer to 25% which says he should be three to one and a horse that's such negative value like that. I want to leave that horse out of the sequence because I want to emphasize the horses that I think are going to offer better value. So that's kind of what I was getting at. And there are some, and by the way, Craig, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I agree with your take on the uh, Steve Asmussen first or Imperial gun has a nice pedigree, but from that post, debuting this is not a situation where steve asperson has a lot of success uh debuting in dirt route races in general especially at oakland so that horse also not for me if he is a short price in here um there are some horses that are listed at big prices on the morning line that i'll be a little surprised if they actually go off that high um one of them is the horse you highlighted the number two tornado road who i completely agree very interesting in this race. You, you summed it up well. That was a super live maiden race on debut, and he took money like they expected something from him. I mean, for a Dwayne Lucas horse, who could have been 30 to 1 that day, for him to go off at 7 to 1 against that field, there was some uh, kind of story on this horse. Now, I went back and watched the Saratoga Live to get uh, Maggie Wolfendale's thoughts on this horse, and um, she had kind of said, obviously, big beautiful horse but he really looked to her like he was going to need a start and ultimately he did um there's pedigree here the damn red uh, 102 buyer uh, uh routing on the dirt uh half to horse caribbean caper who was a stakes horse on the dirt i mean no surprise there's pedigree this horse went for 1.15 million dollars um but the thing i know want to note about that debut race is he was not slow early he actually had a little bit of gate speed but ended up so far back on the chart call just because of the nature of those wilson shoot races at saratoga he actually broke towards the front, but then got a little shuffled back as they came around that half turn and then obviously was finished by the half mile pole. But just based on what I saw from this horse in the early stages, that race now adding blinkers, I'm not going to be surprised if he has a lot more early speed than it looks like on paper. And especially breaking from the two hole, I think he's one that could be forward in here and that could give him a much better chance. And like you said, we see these D-Wayne Lucas's horses improve quite a bit sometimes from start one to start two and start three. So uh, he's one that I could easily project some improvement for. Um, another horse that I'm pretty interested in actually is um, another horse that is coming out of that locked drum roll, please, maiden race at Saratoga. And that's a uh, golden plate, the number nine. And he actually ran a lot better than, uh, than uh, the, uh, the number two uh, tornado road that day. He uh, was off slowly, was uh, checked at the start, very far back early, made a bit of a move around the far turn to pass a few horses and then kind of stayed on at one pace late, obviously beaten 23 legs, but everybody was beaten a, a, a ton, a large margin by the top two finishers that day. Um, I thought that was fairly encouraging. They put blinkers on in his next two starts and both times he's gotten extremely rank in that turf race, he refused to settle with the blinkers. And then last time, uh, Kendrick Carmouche was just basically fighting this horse for the first half mile of that race. He kept throwing his head straight up in the air, just looking really uncomfortable, wanting to run off the entire way while he was trying to be raided at the back of the pack. 
I wish I saw a blinker change today because it seems like something about the blinkers is just really not agreeing with this horse. But Julian Leperu is a pretty calm rider who tends to try to get horses to settle. So, you know, maybe he'll be more relaxed this time. But there's ability in there somewhere, and it might not be so apparent on paper. And then another horse that I think is super interesting coming out of a live race is the number 12, Dutch Mills. I don't love the post position, uh, especially for this distance, but this horse, this debut is is not bad at all. I mean, certainly not uh, meriting a 30 to one morning line. He was beaten by Timberlake, West Saratoga, Can Group, horses that came back to win or run well in stakes races. Um, and also it was at Ellis Park, a race that was just totally dominated by speed in the rail. And Dutch Mills was never on the inside, um, wasn't even that strongly persevered with through the stretch. So obviously just being given an education that day. Now he's coming back. I love the stretch out for him based on pedigree. He's bred to go longer, adding blinkers. I don't know what kind of trip he's going to get from this outside post, but I would expect this horse to run a lot better in this spot. Yeah, you nailed a couple of the horses that I wanted to mention. Uh, no real need to rehash them. That Timberlake race has proven to be an incredibly strong maiden race. I think all the horses who have run back uh, have actually broken their maiden, save maybe one, which you don't often find, and most of them improve their speed figure. So good race. The only other one that caught my eye was the uh, five-horse Michaelicious. Hasn't really done a whole lot of running yet, uh, but has taken money both times for Mike Maker, uh, stretches out the two turns for the first time, and with his breathing, seems like it could be up his alley. Uh, Speed figure took a big jump up second time, and this, as we said, this isn't the strongest maiden race figure-wise on paper. Now, maybe some of the ones we talked about who haven't had much of a chance will take a big jump, but if not, there's no reason Mike Alicious couldn't improve 10, 12 points again and, and be right there at the end. So uh, the big question is, will these horses really big as big a price as at the morning line? Because I, I had some questions about that too. Like when I looked at Tornado Road, the first thing that popped in my mind was, I don't really think this horse is going to be 20 to one given locked and everything we said, but it, it's one that's a little tricky. And, and with it being in the middle of the sequence, a lot of people will probably bet this as, as if the my, morning lines will hold. Yeah, and being in the middle of the sequence, Craig, while those horses might be a shorter price in the wind pool, they could be a much bigger price in the pick five pool because this is a tough sequence and people are trying to craft a ticket through this race might see a horse like Orange Diablo, who when you take a first glance, he's a total standout on speed figures with seeming upside for Brad Cox. And I wonder if this is a place that people try to single without an obvious other single in the sequence. So even if Tornado Road is 10 to 1 in the wind pool, he could be closer to that 15 or 20 to 1 in a, in a pick five sequence. So uh, something to, to consider about uh, the way you might want to bet this race. Um, I agree, Michael Licious, uh, when I watched his debut, he struck me as a horse that would want to go longer. So um, I could see him doing a little better here even though um, he's coming out of races that I think are maybe a, a cup below some others. And one more horse I want to throw out there because we're, we're keeping an open mind in this race. If I'm against the favorite, um, I'm not going to you know marry myself to one 20 to one shot. I want to use a few of them. Um, the number eight Penrod, who he didn't run that much slower than, uh, than, than the favorite in here in his last dirt race an 87 time form us. It compares pretty well to the paired up 91s for orange Diablo and Penrod at least showed speed that day. And I don't see a ton of speed in this race. So he figures to get an aggressive ride from Rafael Bejarano. And that was a strong field catching freedom. The winner, he came back to lose, but ran a competitive speed figure in his next start. The runner up came back to win with a solid number. And he was dueling with that horse early. So, um, Strikes me as one that will be okay routing. I know it looks like he's faded twice in a row, um, but he's bred to route, especially on the damn side. I like the upstarts going longer. So I feel like this is one of these Ron Moquette horses that just kind of needs to race into fitness. And I would expect him to do better here as well. Yeah, I think we agree. This is a, a spread race. Neither one of us like the top two morning line choices. And what you said is exactly what I was getting at. Even if these horses get bet down, uh, they could very well be bigger prices in the pick five. Moving on to the second stakes in this sequence, race nine, the mistletoe, this one going the mile for the Phillies and mares. And, uh, you know, Craig, I'm just seeing the morning line for this race for the first time because we uh, talked about it before uh, it was released. And I'll be interested to see how they bet this race. Uh, it, it it doesn't seem that clear. Um, 
I guess I would hope that a horse like the number four lovely ride takes some money because I don't think either one of us were that thrilled with her chances because it does seem like there is quite a bit of speed signed on in this race. And lovely ride is a horse that did do well at Oaklawn Park last year, actually winning this race in 2022, coming off a similar type of layoff. But she was able to be successful in some paceless situations where she was able to shake loose on the front end. I'm a little skeptical that that can happen here with speeds drawn outside of her. I am as well, and uh, she's coming off quite a long layoff. Uh, she's listed as she's being trained by the assistant for Robertino or Rob, Robertino Diodoro, who is uh, serving a suspension right now. And I think there's more negatives and positives with her. Um, it's not like uh, the races she won last year were all. She did win this race last year. It wasn't the strongest edition we're ever going to see. Her speed figures don't really stick out over the others in here. And it's just that layoff worries me. Now, the one positive is she's done almost all of her best running when she returns from a layoff. Much shorter layoffs in the past, uh, although her second start was off a pretty long one. Uh, but then she tends to tail off, so I guess she has that going for her. But I'm more negative because of the race circumstances. We we talked about the speed and the pace projector. There's quite a bit in here. A lovely ride shown uh, back in second alongside the seven. I guess you could say they're co-second and third. Both behind the nine horse, uh, Adeline Julia, who is a horse who's done most of her running in sprint, stretched out last time, made the lead. So I think the pace situation's a little bit murky as to who might be in the front, but as to if it's going to be fast, I totally agree with the pace projector. I don't think anybody's getting away with it easy. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Even though two of the Robertino or former Robertino Diodoro horses are shown up in that pace, horses like the number six, Coastal Charm, and especially the number seven, Everlessly Elegant, who seems like a, a horse that showed a ton of speed sprinting last time, would probably want to get forward in here. Um, they're going to be close up to the pace, and a long shot like Charlie May stretching out from sprints also probably has to go. So it does seem like something has to give towards the front end. And it makes me a little skeptical of all of these speed horses. I mean, of them, the one that I probably like the most is um, <clears throat> the number six Coastal Charm. But she's another horse who, while she doesn't need the lead and she can get a stalking trip, she generally does best in races that feature pace situations that are a little more moderate. You go through her past performances. You really don't see any of those red color coded pace figures. So I just wonder about how the trips are going to work out for a lot of these horses. And Greg, I know that a horse you like um, just seems to fit this race pretty well. That's the number two, Misty Vale, um, getting a little bit of class relief. And you could say she's not the winningest type uh, with those 10 second place finishes to go along with her six victories. But she's probably getting a little bit of class relief and she drew well for this race. Yeah, she is getting class relief. I mean, you look at the time form U.S. race ratings, most of hers in the... Uh... Last five races are well at the 115 marker above. This one's only a 110. She has solid speed figures last time. But what caught my eye mostly was how often this filly just catches races with no pace. Uh, she does have tactical speed to stay close, but I don't think that's when she does her best running. Um, as you said, she doesn't win all that much, but it just seems like she's going to get a great trip from the inside. Plenty of pace in front of her, and she just seems like the logical horse to me. Uh, not that I'm going to use her as a single, but she would definitely be my top pick and a horse I use as an A. Yeah, I do think she makes a lot of sense. I mean, horses like Shotgun Hottie, Led to Vita, Search Results, Kijera, who she's been facing in her last four starts, they're all better than what she's meeting here. Um, and she's supposed to get the right kind of pace set up. I do have some questions about her last speed figure. We've talked about it, that Kijera Fall City, but she's got plenty of other numbers that put her in the mix. So I don't want to harp on that too much. Um, the horse that's shown as the morning line favorite is actually the number 10, Ice Orchid, at the a lukewarm seven to two. I guess, I mean... I think she makes a lot of sense in here from a pace standpoint, and she seems like she's fairly consistent on the way into this. I don't know if her ceiling is quite as high as some others in here from a speed figure standpoint, and it's not like she's a horse that loves to win races either, but if she's able to get any kind of ground-saving trip from this wide post position, she's supposed to be in the mix at the end. Yeah, I guess. I, I saw the morning line this morning. I, I'm not sure she'll be the favorite. I would tend to think it'll be lovely ride, but we'll see on that front. But what kind of catches my eye is, you know, we highlight the horses in the field uh, in the top three. 
she hasn't beaten Lovely Ride the two times she's tried. She lost the Coastal Charm the one time she tried her. So just seems like a, a very, even if she is the favorite, just a very vulnerable type to me, especially given that outside post position. The horse that I was most interested in is the number five, Saddle of Jesse. And Craig, I know you have some interest in this horse too. Um, just one that's proven to be a very good claim for Brittany Russell and uh, Mike Ryan, the owner, um, picking this horse up for just $20,000 back at the beginning of January. Um, they must have seen something in this horse to take her out of that claiming race at Santa Anita for, um, despite not having very appealing form on the way in. There is some pedigree here. She cost a lot of money as a yearling. So maybe they just bought her as a broodmare prospect or one to sell later on. But she certainly worked out for them coming back off a layoff. She's won three of her last five starts, three of four on the dirt. The one loss on the dirt was a second place finish, two back. Um, and she's just progressively moved up in class and continued to improve her form. And I really liked her last race. She made an impressive move coming around the far turn to take over and was able to win comfortably in the end. She's got to get a little bit faster in here, but she appears to fit the pace situation of this race really well. She's drawn a decent post position, and uh, I, I'm definitely scared of Brittany Russell whenever she ships out, out for a horse like this because she's not one that's just firing random bullets in stakes races. Um, if she's shipping a horse to Oakland, I tend to think it's pretty live. Yeah, for sure. And when you look up the chart from her last race, it's proven to be a pretty strong race. Uh, if anything, maybe it's underrated. The runner-up that day came back to finish second in a good allowance. Speed figure regressed a little bit, but I think it was just too far for that horse. The uh, fifth place finisher that day, a horse named Dry Well, was basically running right with Saddle Up Jesse. Wasn't able to keep up, was beaten 18 lengths. Came back to win a, a really nice allowance race, turning back to seven furlongs with a much improved speed figure. So, yeah, I think she's very dangerous in here. And really, her and I'll have co A's in here the, uh, the five horse and the two horse Misty Vale. And not to harp on it too much, Craig, but the two horses that we like in here, um, Saddle Up Jesse and the number two, Misty Vale, um, with the allowance conditions of this race, they're getting seven pounds from basically all of the other major contenders in here. So sometimes the allowance weights just work out that way, but I, it is helping those two horses a little bit. And if you have the weight adjustment turned on in your time form U.S. past performances, um, that will be factored into the speed figures. So that's why they maybe look a little favorable on time form U.S. as well. And I, I think that's uh, one reason why Craig and I might be gravitating a little bit towards those two. Let's move on to the last leg of this sequence. As I mentioned earlier, this is the other division of that $140,000 purse and one X allowance race that went as race seven. Um, this uh, six furlong, same distance as the earlier race and another large field signed on here. And I really struggled with this race, Craig. I mean, there are some short prices that I think we have to discuss, but I'm, a little bit skeptical of really all of them. It's just a race where I don't think anyone is standing on particularly solid ground. And I mean, let's start with a horse that I think could go favored in here. And the number one, a don't wait up who was coming off a, uh, a two length victory last time in a starter allowance race at Churchill. Um, it got a big buyer of 94, which I think will attract some support to this horse. Uh, the time form us number is a little bit lower, but I don't trust this horse. I mean, he's, a horse who has done his best running when he's able to make the lead. I don't see that he necessarily has to have the lead in this race because there's plenty of speed drawn outside of him, even though this isn't a race that has the, fa the fast pace flag. Um, I could easily see this pace heating up a little bit. He's drawn the inside, which I think forces his hand a little bit. And that last race at Churchill... It's got the red color coding for the day in time form US indicating a speed bias. When I go back and watch a few races, especially this race, it also feels like maybe the rail was a good place to be. The runner up just came up the rail to get second. This horse was on the rail the entire way. So I wonder if that effort's a little bit dressed up and, well, he does have some prior races that give him a big chance in here. His other big speed figure was also arguably earned on a speed and rail bias at Ellis Park back in June. So I just wonder if this horse isn't as good as he might look at first glance. I agree with that. I, I think there's a lot of negatives with this horse. I think that track was clearly speed rail bias last time. And it, it was just that race was over before they uh, even hit the half mile pole. I mean, there was nobody ever challenged them. Wasn't the strongest field. You can see it. Um, if you go back and look through the chart, it wasn't an allowance race. It was a starter allowance. So he's obviously in good form, but from the rail, uh, 
I, I don't trust him. He's a horse who two back. He went one from slightly off the pace, but there are a lot of horses in this field who, when you scan the PPs, they only win on the lead. I mean, there's probably three or four. I, I was a little surprised this didn't have the fast pace flag. When I look through, it makes sense. Uh, a lot of these horses who win only on the lead don't always show speed. Therefore, they're they're not really considered true front runners, but they do their best running on the end. So I, I tend to think this race is going to heat up a little bit. I will start with the speed uh, horse that I am interested in if he's able to get clear and the pace projector says he will. It's the five horse Bolt 45. Uh, he's one I would be interested in here. We haven't seen him since July. He's just a three-year-old, uh, but he has been running against older horses since uh, late in the spring. Uh, his last two starts, he beat him in an allowance. He faced uh, Ultimate, who's in the stake race. I don't think we talked about him today, but we talk about him in our race preview. We don't like him in that race, but he's a pretty solid horse. And I think Bolt 45 could very well get clear in here. I think his last running line looks a lot worse than it is. It was only a four horse field. So once the rider realized he wasn't getting anything, he just kind of wrapped them up, finished beating 12 lengths. But he was in a three horse speed duel that day on the inside, a very tough spot to be. And I just think he's really dangerous if he can get clear. That is a big if, but he's 15 to one. Uh, I'll turn it back to you. I have a couple more I want to that, that I want to discuss, including the horse that is even longer price that I probably like a little bit more. But since we were talking about speed, I, I do like Bolt 45 and think he has a shot here. Yeah, he's he's a horse that I I wasn't sure what to do with. Um, at first glance, I mean, yeah, he's got that number two back that makes him competitive with this field. I always have a little trouble putting faith in Prairie Meadows form, Craig. I mean, I I know they have some different medication rules there. I see horses that uh, post big speed figures at Prairie Meadows that just don't get duplicated other places. Um, this horse, I mean, I'm not going to put too much stock in his Keeneland race as a two-year-old, um, but it, I just wonder if we're going to see him transfer that form to Oaklawn, especially coming off this layoff. I, I didn't know what to do with him. And I kind of agreed with what you were getting at first, that even though this race doesn't have the fast pace flag, I agree. I see a lot of speed in here, and I could certainly see this coming apart a little bit. Um, so it, I want to open up my mind to some horses that can close from off the pace. Uh, among those is the number nine, Affable Monarch. Uh, he's the one that's shown last on the pace projector, but he does have that LP flag indicating the uh, the fastest late pace rating in the field. I don't know. I, I've i never really pegged this horse as a sprinter. I've been familiar with him from when he was competing in New Jersey and New York over the past couple of seasons. Um, he's a, a, a classic son of Arrogate who takes a long time to, to find his stride. I will say, though, um, his one sprint effort was his career debut, and he was really impressive that day, making a big run from off the pace to win by over six lengths. It came against much weaker horses. The speed figure wasn't anything to write home about, but maybe turning back is going to help this horse a little bit if there's some pace. Um, clearly, the connections are wanting to experiment with this, uh, having claimed him at a bunch of routes and uh, the, the first race they're targeting is this sprint. Um, he's off a bit of a layoff, so maybe you could um, view it as being a prep race. I don't know. Um, if he's a big price, I could, could include him somewhere, but he's not a horse that I wanted to lean on too hard. He's just an interesting horse in the race that might fit the situation if we're right about how this pace plays out. Um, a horse that I think just makes a lot of sense in here, Craig, that um, if I had to make a top pick, I'd probably lean towards is the number 11 gun flash. Um, his form coming from Remington Park and Lone Star is a little tough to read. Uh, but what I will say is, while they've tried a variety of distances with him over the past couple of seasons, I like him sprinting. I mean, he's won each of his last three races going shorter than seven furlongs. I'm not going to hold the, the one seven furlong loss against him uh, when he ran against uh, Rivet and, and Mulligan in that stakes race at Ellis Park. That was too tough a spot. Um, but he won some sprints at Lone Star earlier in the year and then finally turned back to his sprint at Remington last time. And that race is legitimate. I mean, he won by a convincing five lengths over a horse, Campfire Creed, who if he was in this race, we'd be talking about him as a contender. He's got plenty of speed figures that would put him in the mix. So he beat a, a nice horse last time. And 
I just think that six furlongs is probably the right distance for him. He's drawn well outside of some other speed types, and it's not like he needs to be on the front, unlike he was last time. He's closed effectively in the past. He's got a live rider on board. So I just think Gunflash makes a lot of sense. Probably the most likely winner in my book, and he might not be the favorite. No, I agree. Uh, he's definitely going to be on my ticket. I prefer him much more than I do. Uh, we're saying the favorite. Uh, is he the more? Yeah, I guess don't wait up. Is the morning line favorite in here? Oh, no, the seven, who we haven't gotten to, is the morning line favorite in here. Um, so, yeah, I think Gunflash is the most likely winner. Since I brought up WW Scouts Honor uh, the and the Fairmount Shipper, I keep saying Fairmount, Fandle Racing, people know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's Scott Becker again, uh, a horse who kind of beats up on inferior competition. At least he did last race. He's run fine here at Oakland, run some good speed figures. The problem is he only wins when he makes the lead. When you look through his BPs, he's competitive. When he doesn't make the lead, he just doesn't get the job done. And I'm not sure that he's going to be able to make the lead in this spot. So I'm a little bit against him uh, as I am some of the other speed horses. The long shot I was really interested in is the three St. Andrews. Look, I know he's uh, against it on the speed figure scale, but he does appear to be a first-time gelding. He's shipping in from the East Coast. Um, he's a horse who they show him as gelded after his last race. It makes sense when you look at his past performances. I don't think it happened before the last one. And he's just a horse whose PPs are littered with blue fractions, some of them in routes. He doesn't show a lot of speed, at least the last couple going a mile, but he has done okay sprinting. Uh, so similar to, to how you mentioned Gunflash, not quite to the same level, but at the price in a race that may be a little murky that I think we both agree could heat up on the front end. I like his inside draw, and I'm expecting a much better race from him. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to uh, say too much about the 7WW uh, Scouts Honor. He's actually he's actually the full brother to the other Scott Becker horse that we just talked about earlier. Um, this one, I like the form of um, about as well. Um, I think he could win this race if he's a short price. Doesn't do much for me. Um, so I wanted to keep an open mind with regard to some bigger prices, as you did, Craig. Um, as for that horse you mentioned, the three St. Andrews, I, I also took a look at this horse. I couldn't get there. Um, my big issue with him was just class. I mean, all of his race ratings are, are significantly lower than the race that he's in today. Um, and he even stepped up last time into a race that had a higher race rating, not as high as today's, and he just got drowned. Um, unfavorable pace set up, probably too long for him, but um, it I couldn't get there. I will say his trainer, Greg Compton, does send out some live runners at Oakland. So um, that's probably a positive. I actually also liked a horse that was a huge price on the morning line that um, not my top pick in the race, but one that I would want to include somewhere. Kind of a weird horse. Um, the number eight, Hey Eugene, who's 30 to one on the line. I don't know if he can be 30 to one for, for connections. They typically take more money than that. Um, but look, his recent form gives him no chance. But going all the way back to Oaklawn Park at the start of his career, in his debut, he was second to rivet and looked like a horse with serious potential at that time, came back and won his next race um, in a decent effort. Uh, after that, they tried the turf and then things sort of went off the rails. I mean, I guess they saw he's an Ohio bred, so might they decided to, I don't even know, know if Mike Maker has a string of thistle down, but they set him to thistle down to be a heavy favorite in a string of races and he won at one to 20, one to 10, one to five. I mean, he won a string of races, um, lost last time. And obviously that's a bad sign losing to inferior horses. But I wonder if this is just a horse that they, they lost the way with, and they're not bringing him to Oakland to run in a, a $16,000 claimer where it looks like he belongs based on speed figures. They're running him in this N1X allowance race. So I think there's probably more here than meets the eye in terms of those recent efforts. It's got a live rider on board and Vasquez. Um, I don't know what price he's going to be, but I think this is a horse that once had potential and might have, uh, might be able to do better than that recent form indicates. So I'm definitely going to include uh, the number eight. Hey, Eugene somewhere. Another horse that I was trying to make a case for. And again, I couldn't quite get there um, was the number 12 Ben Benjamins who, looks competitive on speed figures and has the right kind of running style for this race as a closer. 
I just went back and watched his races and there just wasn't a whole lot for me to grasp. He's a kind of the kind of horse that starts to wind up on the turn and then just doesn't really get there. He's more of a minor award type than a win candidate. And um, a few of those races, when I started to dig into the fields, they don't look as strong as I expected them to. So um, he was a horse that when I started looking at him, I thought I was going to like him. And then I ended up kind of wanting to use him more as an underneath type than a win horse. Yeah, when I looked at him, he just struck me as a, a grinder. He doesn't really, he kind of gets himself into the race, but then he just doesn't do anything. He just kind of follows everybody home. So it, he's only five to one on the morning line. So I, I wasn't very interested. I, I did just one comment about your horse, Hey Eugene. When you look at his speed figures, he's run 83s, 84s the last three races. He did run that 99 against uh, in an Ohio bred allowance race. And I do think that is more to his ability when you watch his couple wins after that. Um, I, I think there was probably more in the tank. As you said, he was a very heavy favorite. The one, two back, he had some real trouble at the start, uh, had to circle the field at what was a very short price and get up. So, um, he would still need to improve off that 99, but I wouldn't base him. I wouldn't consider his last three speed figures as really representative of what he is as a horse. Well, Craig, uh, we've mentioned a lot of horses in this sequence, so it's not going to be an easy one to put together. Um, let's go through. Um, I'll throw it to you first. And, you know, this might not be a pick five sequence that you want to invest uh, what is really required to cover all your opinions. But I know there are some horses throughout that you might want to make some win bets on. So um, let, let's talk about it from from those perspectives. Yeah, starting in the stakes race, I would consider Rivet and A for me. And then I would use three others in here. Osborne, who you mentioned the blinker change. Uh, you kind of sold me on him. Uh, Top Gunner, who... He's a big question mark, but I think he's going to be a big price and maybe he could get loose. And the, the price horse I actually prefer the most would be Sir Wellington, who from that outside post just seems like he's going to get a perfect trip. And it's just a matter of if he's going to be good enough or not. Uh, in that allowance race, Helmstead, I think it is just super dangerous in here. A couple others I wanted to use were T Burns and Megan's honor. Don't really love this race. I, I'm most of my play would go through the five Helmstead uh, in the eighth race, that maiden race. I'm going to spread quite a bit in this race. Uh, the more I thought about it. Yeah. I'm not using the seven, the five favorite. I'm not using Imperial gun and just going to use many of the horses that we talked about. Tornado road was one of them. Michaelicious, um, I'd have to look back to remember all of them, but there were three or four all at big prices. This would, this race would be one that would separate me from the rest because even if some of those horses get bet down, I think in the pick five, they will be pretty good prices. Uh, next up in the mistletoe stakes, uh, most of my play would go through the two Misty Veil vale and the five Saddle Up Jesse. I may use Lovely Ride a little bit just because she does well off of layoffs. Uh, I'm not a fan of the pace situation, but it just seems like maybe she would slip through the cracks. Uh, I wish this was a race that we could see the odds. We obviously can't because if she gets bet down in vertical plays, I wouldn't be interested in her at all. But still, most of my play going through the two and the five. And then in the 10th race, I'm going to uh, use some long prices in here. The three who I mentioned, St. Andrews. Uh, I think all those blue fractions maybe have dirtied up his form a little bit. I think Bolt 45 is very dangerous on the front end. Uh, I think he could wind up being the speed of the speed. And the most likely winner, in my opinion, and, and yours as well, was Gunflash. And I don't want to totally dismiss him. It's a race where a, a ton of horses have went wire to wire, and that's how they get success. That's how Gunflash won his last race. But I think he's far from a need-to-lead type. He gets a good outside post. He went wire to wire last time, basically crawling on the front end. I, I think it was more by default that he took the lead in a four horse field. He had the inside post. Uh, I'm not going to tie him to that running style. Yeah, and as I go through uh, this sequence, I think this is one that I could craft an affordable ticket for um, if I you know narrow things down in a few races. Um, the first uh, leg, race six, the ring the bell, um, the horses that I'm leaning towards the most are Osborne and Rivet. Um, 
Tejano Twist is a horse that I would want to use. Um, I'll have to see how this all uh, comes up from a price standpoint. If he's an A or a B for me, I'm kind of leaning towards making him a B with maybe uh, Sir Wellington as more of a C type. But um, I would want most of the play to go through Osborne and Rivet in the seventh race. I'm basically too deep in here with um, the five Halmstad and the four Underhill's tab. Um, I, I like those two the most. Maybe I could make the 11 B out of C, but I really just wanted to stick with the two that I liked in here because I just think that it's, it's pretty top heavy in terms of quality. In the eighth race, I'm going to leave off that Brad Cox train favorite, like I said, um, and I want to use some prices in here. Those would be the number two, Tornado Road, the number five, Mike Alicious, the number eight, Penrod, the number nine, Golden Plate, and the number 12, Dutch Mills. Yeah, that's five horses, but they're all going to be prices in this race. If I had to slot them into A's and B's, um, I'd probably make Tornado Road and Dutch Mills A's and maybe the five, eight, and nine Bs, but um, I, I'd want to keep that fluid um, depending on how the rest of the sequence comes up because I, I think this is a race that if you can be right about beating that Brad Cox favorite, it's going to make the sequence pay. In the ninth race, I'd probably want to lean a little bit on Saddle Up Jesse as the A. I, I, just, I just think she fits this race really well. And then the backups for me would be Misty Vale and Ice Orchid. But uh, I'm going to try to to keep this one, which looks pretty competitive, relatively thin. Um, and then in the last leg, race 10, confusing race. But um, I like the number 11 gun flash. He'd probably be the A horse for me. And then I would use a, a series of Bs. Um, those horses would be the number 7 WW Scouts Honor, who I don't love, but just is a uh, a logical horse. Um, the number eight, Hey Eugene, who uh, I, I do think is interesting at a big price. And the number nine, Affable Monarch, who I'm not convinced that he's going to love the cutback, but I could see this race coming apart enough for a horse like him who does have quality. So um, that's, that's kind of how I'm leaning in a, a difficult sequence, Craig, but one that if you can be right and can narrow down your opinions a little bit to really emphasize them, it's one where you, you do have the potential to make a nice score. Yeah, I like this sequence, and I think we both came up with some price sources that we're going to use. Uh, you got to have those if you're going to play pick fives. Otherwise, you're just uh, going to get beat up over the long run. You, when you hit, you have to get paid. We've talked about it many times, and hopefully we gave out some good opinions on some horses who can boost that payoff to, to make it worthwhile. Well, everybody, that's it for the Time Form US podcast this week. Craig and I will be back next week. And just as we mentioned on our last podcast, to remind everybody, um, next week will be our final week of podcasts for 2023. We're going to wrap things up with one more pace cast and one more forecast next week, and then take a little bit of a break to the end of the year, a couple weeks off, and we'll come back uh, with our typical podcast schedule in uh, 2024, but uh, going to take a little break at the end of the year. Everybody, thanks for listening to these times. Inform US podcast this week and every week. Remember, you can always catch them on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Again, thanks for tuning in and make sure to catch that Time Form US Pacecast coming up next Tuesday.